the inside story on the issues that affect you and your community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. I'm Dan Hurley. It may be satisfying to think in nationalistic terms, but the reality is that we live in a global economy. And despite popular rhetoric, the benefits of global business operation go both ways. In metropolitan Cincinnati alone, over 200 companies from 16 different European countries have a physical presence. Collectively, they employ more than 32,500 people. This is just the European activity and does not take into account the investment of companies from Australia, Asia, and Africa. Many of the European companies operating in our region are manufacturers, like the Italian-based Eurostampa, which are producing solid, well-paid, middle-class manufacturing jobs. And some, like ThyssenKrupp Bilstein, I'll get corrected on that, have expanded three times since initially building in Hamilton, Ohio, creating more manufacturing jobs every time they expand. I am joined this morning by Todd Schwartz, the, exec the new executive director of the European American Chamber of Commerce. Before assuming his new role last month, Mr. Schwartz retired as a counselor from the Foreign Service of the United States, where he served for 28 years. His overseas postings included Germany, Saudi Arabia, Tunisia, Qatar, the Philippines, Kuwait, Canada, and Iraq, and Doug Mormon, the president of the Board of Trustees of the European American Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Mormon, is the vice president of Development Strategies Group, which helps clients secure public incentives to promote business, uh, find a location, expand, and retain jobs. Welcome to Newsmakers. Doug, welcome back. Todd, Thank welcome you. to Cincinnati. Thank you, Glad to be back. Glad to be here. How many, Todd, how many European American chambers, that kind of format, how many are there of, of those in the United States? Is this something that is just every place? You'll be surprised to learn that uh, the EACC in Cincinnati was the first European American Chamber of Commerce opened in the United States. Uh, we have chapters in New York, in New Jersey, in the Carolinas, uh, at, in addition to the three chapters that we have in France. Wow, that's, so we, we were leading on this edge. Exactly. And because of that, Doug, is that one of the reasons we have this many European companies? If, can you point to the activity of the chamber over the years mm -hmm. as actually attracting specific businesses? Uh, we can indeed point to the, uh, the activities of the chamber that resulted in businesses located in Cincinnati. Uh, we've done that in partnership with lots of groups. It used to be the Cincinnati USA Regional Partnership for Economic Development. Now it's Ready Cincinnati. Right. Uh, but we do this through partnerships. But we have been successful in attracting uh, a great number of European companies, and not just from the typical countries that you'd imagine. It's not just France. It's not just Germany. Uh, in fact, we've had four Finnish companies that have lo located here probably in the last three years. Uh, so we reach out to all of the continent of Europe in an effort to try and attract those businesses to the United mm -hmm. States. But the base we have is strong, and really what that does is give permission for companies uh, located throughout Europe to look at Cincinnati as a viable place for their business. So what's it mean to reach out? Doug used the term reach out. What do you have to do to actively recruit somebody? Do you get to go to Europe? <laughs> it's sort of my question. <laughs> Not yet, uh, although we're definitely working on plans for that, maybe even going as early as this fall. Uh, but we work, with, uh, we work with the local businesses. I mean, success begets success. So if there's four Italian companies that are operating here uh, successfully, the fifth one is the easiest one to get. So, uh, you know, so we work with our, our partners in the uh, various embassies. We have the Italian ambassador uh, coming here in May. Uh, we're bringing in an Italian trade delegation here next month. We're sending in a delegation uh, to Italy to look at um, potential uh, investments in um, high tech and, and innovative products. Uh, so, you know, it's all about um, building relationships with the companies, with our uh, international partners, um, working with Ready, working with Triad, working with the City of Mason uh, in partnership to identify where are the opportunities and then help those uh, mm -hmm. potential investors find, you know, learn why Cincinnati is a great place to do business. Doug, why are companies interested here? What is it that when company you're reaching out to a company, they say, okay, I want to expand in the United States, <laughs> I can go a lot of places, what is it that they want to hear about that might tip it one way or the other where they go? 
Uh, it's really location, 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 exactly. Dan. Uh, we have a great case to make to locate in Cincinnati. Part of it is a cost issue, but a big part of it is location. It's the availability of workforce, but it's our central p location in the United States. A lot of European companies think about New York. They think about Boston when they think about coming to America. When you draw a circle around New York, you get a lot of ocean. When you draw a circle around Cincinnati, you get a lot of customers and a lot of suppliers. So our location is a blessing for our community. It's really something that uh, we use as a strong tool in attracting companies to so locate location. Here. Well, and I, I, on location, I would just say, you know, I've, I've heard the estimate that says 50% of the manufacturing facilities within the United States, within North America, are located within a single day's drive of Cincinnati. That's a huge bonus. And when you add on top of that, as you mentioned, workforce, uh, you know, skilled workforce, uh, the transportation network that we have, uh, and the educational institutions that we have, uh, the engineers that are coming out of uh, out of UC, the uh, uh, business students that are coming out of Miami. I mean, there's some great opportunities, and, and it's a great place to do business. And in this sort of thing, you have to think regionally, and that would take in uh, the engineering at University of Dayton of and the facilities of the air. Uh, base mm -hmm. in outside of Dayton. There's a lot of research, a lot of stuff going on uh, just north of what people normally think mm -hmm. of as our region. Yeah, we have we have a we we call ourselves the EACC of Greater Cincinnati. We have a looser definition of Greater Cincinnati than I think most people would use. So you were mentioning there's all these manufacturing uh, and you said something, Doug. Todd, is it is the high? Do you have priorities of what kind of company? And as I look down the list, it seems like a lot of manufacturing comp companies. And one of the ones that came recently was Festo out in Mason. We have a little, uh, we have some footage from there. But what kind of companies do you see as desirable to, to get here? Well, I think the most important companies that, that we want to have come here are the companies that can make a profit here, that are willing to employ you know good numbers of people in, in high paying jobs. Uh, you know, as for the particular sectors, it's less a question of what do we want and what makes more what makes sense in this economy and in this region. I mean, aviation obviously is a uh, there's an important destination with GE Aviation here. Um, automotive, because of course the supply chains that go up and down the I-75, I-71 core. Orders. Um, but logistics companies, uh, you know, high tech, I mean, Cincinnati is becoming a, a great destination for high tech companies. Um, you know, but for us, the priority is the company that will come here and, okay. and create some jobs. Okay. Um, in the, uh, what is going on sort of the environment right now, a lot of the companies that I saw on your list that are already here are from the UK. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was recently in uh, England mm -hmm. and just after the UK, uh, after the Brexit vote, and a lot of talk that still is working its way through. How does Brexit impact your work with the European Chamber? Mm -hmm. How does the current administration, our administration, criticism of the EU, downplaying, sort of dismissing the EU. How does that impact the your ability to do your work, Doug? Any thoughts about that? Well, I think that certainly incidents like that make it a little bit more challenging because what we want to do is present a, a very favorable possibility, a very favorable opportunity to do business in the United States, uh, with Cincinnati being the preferred destination, but. What we need to do to overcome that is continue to push on things about the quality of life that we offer, about the workforce that we have available here, about the stability of this region economically. You know, one of the strengths that we have is we don't have the high highs in the economy, but we don't have the low lows. This is a destination that you can, uh, where you can locate your business that's stable. It's where you can find a workforce, and it's where, you, we, as you've demonstrated with the chart that you showed, where a lot of companies like yours from Europe have come and been able to make a profit and be successful. So I think that stability is an important factor that can overcome some of the other things in the environment right now. And then I would just add, you know, the, the statistics are, are clear about how important our trade with Europe is. I mean, 50% uh, of the world's global output 
uh, comes from Europe and North America, and that's you know regions with only 10% of the world's population. 31% of Cincinnati's exports uh, in 2015 went to the 28 countries of the European Union. That's seven and a half billion dollars. That's really, really important for this region. Um, so, so we're tied both ways. Mm -hmm. Exactly. G going through all of this. Exactly right. Um, one of the things that exists out there is something called the foreign trade zone, and there's two of them in our mm -hmm. immediate region, uh, one in southwest Ohio, one in northern Kentucky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's a foreign trade zone? Because that's one of the mysteries that I wasn't, I it was like, because I did some mm -hmm. research, it's like, this is interesting, I just don't know what it is. We work very closely with uh, the uh, the foreign trade zones here in uh, in Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky. Foreign trade zones basically provide an opportunity uh, for investors, uh, whether they're uh, U.S. based or international based, to um, avoid taxes on products that will be manufactured within the U.S. But then, uh, from components brought from outside the United mm -hmm. States and exported outside the United States, so mm -hmm. uh, it's a bit like a customs a customs bond. Uh, you know, these are great ways for companies to avoid unnecessary costs, both for accounting as well as just, uh, you know, to to pay taxes and to reclaim taxes. Um, but at the same time, you know, create an opportunity for a manufacturing facility to be built here uh, that generates uh, a lot of jobs. Mm -hmm. um, there's a number of things that, if you go to your website, and we're going to send people to your website mm -hmm. and let them know how to find that, but. When you sort of explore that, one of the things that interested me, uh, Doug, was the uh, this internship program mm -hmm. that uh, the, the chamber offers. Talk a little bit about that. Who's interning for who here? Sure. We've worked with the University of Cincinnati to develop this J-1 uh, program. It's a visa program uh, whereby interns can come from specific, not specifically Europe, but we focus on Europe, to the United States for an immersion in working with the United States company. Uh, what we found is it's great for the company because they're able to bring in talent, they're able to bring in their up and coming uh, workforce and expose them to work in the United States to see how they re respond to that. It also gives the company a chance to get a, a better look at that, that, that potential employee. So we think this is a great way uh, to both promote Cincinnati because hopefully that person goes back to their home country as an ambassador, but it also gives the company a great opportunity to educate that person, to expose them to a new culture, and to really see how they fit into the environment that that corporation is trying to create. Just about out of time, but one last question, Todd. Sure. You um, graduate of Miami, you grew up in southwest Ohio, Dayton. Um, coming back here after your career in the Foreign Service, having lived all over the world, mm -hmm. what's the most surprising thing for you as you've moved back to this part of the country? Um, I think the dynamism. I had, uh, you know, living overseas, I'd, I'd heard, you know, the reports about the death of cities in the United States and so forth. Uh, but to come back here and to see how exciting uh, this region is, to see the continued growth, uh, the energy, uh, you know, the, the willingness to, to accept change. Uh, I look at Mayor Cranley's efforts on um, uh, opening the city up to immigrants. I mean, all of those things are just adding to the value of this region and making it just a wonderful place to be. Well, thank you for being here this morning. Thank you, Dan. Todd, good a luck pleasure. with your thank work. You. And Doug, your ongoing work on, on lots of things, and this being Thanks. one of them, uh, uh, look forward to getting to know you and um, and finding out more about the companies that we're able to attract. Here. Excellent. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, at, well, wait a minute. Before I do that, we have uh, let let me tell you how to get in touch with the European American Chamber, and it's www.europe-cincinnati.com, and the telephone number is seven six two. Uh, 3724, I can hardly read. Stay tuned <laughs> after the break. A creative way of looking at the real abilities of people sometimes overlooked in our community. Welcome back. In 2012, Cincinnati became the first city beyond New York to host a Real Abilities Film Festival. Five years later, a dozen cities have followed the lead of New York and Cincinnati. And in 2014, the festival's national headquarters moved right here to Cincinnati, where it is managed by Living Arrangements for Developmentally Disabled, 
more popularly known as LAD. The centerpiece of the festival are films that are screened, but in formal and informal discussions around the films and other events, the community has the opportunity to explore, discuss, embrace, celebrate the diversity of our shared human experience. This year, the Real Abilities Film Festival returns to Cincinnati on March the 9th and runs through March the 12th. Before I introduce my guests, let's take a look at a PSA that was produced for this. At PNG, diversity is essential, and we believe that inclusion is a game changer. We want every talent used, every voice involved, because that's when we deliver our best work. Our commitment to and passion for this work is why PNG has partnered to help bring the Real Abilities Film Festival to Cincinnati. You will experience powerful films about people moving through the world differently, and you will leave perceiving the world differently. That's the power of real abilities. I am joined now by Susan Brown Knight, the executive director of LAD, Living Arrangements for the Developmentally Disabled. Susan served as the managing director of the Real Abilities Film Festival in 2015. On uh, Susan's right, uh, you will see Scott Van Nice, who works for Procter & Gamble in cybersecurity. Mr. Van Nice manages digital forensics investigations that involve cybersecurity, employee issues, uh, and regulatory legal proceedings. And on my immediate right uh, is Hunter Bryant, an interpreter who works with Mr. Van Nice every day at Procter & Gamble. So uh, first off, thank you all of you for being here this morning. And uh, this is going to be a little bit different because Hunter is here again, as she does every day, working with Scott. But I, it's weird to not be talking to Hunter directly. <laughs> so anyway, Hunter, I'm glad you're here too. Thank uh, you. <laughs> My pleasure. Uh, so let's begin, Susan, with uh, the importance of this film festival because real abilities, which just so everybody's clear, it's R E E L. Yeah. So it's about films. Absolutely this has definitely. just been taken off. It's amazing. It's it's so humbling, frankly, to see how the community is united around this film festival. Academia, government, the private sector, the nonprofit sector, everybody's come together um, to recognize and celebrate our shared human experience. And I, as somebody that has put so much um, passion, time, and energy into this, to see people really embrace it and see its value has personally been very touching, but also incredible for the people at supports because it's their voice as well. It's a platform for their voice. The people you work with every day can every see day. themselves in the films. They can meet people who can be role models uh, like Scott, um, like the Michigan judge who was here a couple of years ago Absolutely. and who I understand is coming back this year. He is. It is just amazing, uh, the people who are here. Uh, Scott, how long have you been working for Procter & Gamble and what was your background that allowed you to get the job that you have? Really, I've been working for PNG for 15 years and I actually came from the Rochester Institute of Technology. That was my background. It was information technology, and that's how I moved into cybersecurity. And Procter & Gamble, to Susan's point, is one of those companies, people in the community that really embrace diversity, uh, because as soon as I came to PNG, immediately they said, what can we do to make sure you succeed at your peak? Uh, work with us and that was the main reason why I have Hunter here. I have had a long relationship with her ever since. So on a day-by-day -day basis you too are working side by side is that my understanding so that if you go into a meeting or you have to um, uh, talk with somebody uh, about what you're working on the two of you can work together. So, so is, is Hunter available to you all the time you're at work? Exactly right, yes. In the, the specific word is what you call a designated interpreter or term, and Hunter is a designated interpreter, and I'm a deaf professional. And sometimes you'll see the uh, acronym DP slash DI. And to, to your point, yes, I'll go into a meeting and Hunter is my interpreter. Uh, she trusts me, I trust her. So we both work together as a team. And Scott, how long have you been with PNG? 
15 years. 15 years, so this isn't new. Yeah. The designated interpreter, it actually is new because over the past several years, though, it's been neat. A lot of companies are starting to recognize that, and a few other companies are actually bringing in designated interpreters for their deaf employees, which is a fantastic effort. You know, uh, Susan, so often people begin discussions like this by talking about disabilities yeah. and real abilities is f trying to flip that on its head. When I think P&G, but a lot of companies in this area as well, Fifth Third Bank, Candlelight, who is our presenting sponsor, they all recognize that disability is kind of in name only, that it is actually a precursor to innovation. So if you think about somebody who moves through the world differently and the problems they have to solve, just before, just as we're getting to work in the morning, because the whole system is set up for somebody that is typical to succeed, not necessarily for somebody who moves through the world differently. The problem solving ability is incredible. So it really is a precursor to innovation, to solving big problems. It's an incredible asset to any team to bring that perspective um, to the conversation. And so P&G recognizes that, Fifth Third Bank, Candlelight Company, a lot of folks are recognizing the power of disability to uh, add to the diversity of any private uh, company. Scott, you've been with P&G for 15 years. Um, in the early years, how was the reception? Was, were you sort of a lone pioneer in that environment? Or, uh, and and, and how, how were you accepted by your coworkers? Really, the accept, acceptance has been fantastic. Yes, I agree. A lot of times I felt like the lone pioneer, um, definitely part of the minority, but Procter & Gamble recognizes the minority, and they really understand the importance and the philosophy of first, seek to understand, and that's one of the reasons why P&G is very successful. So I can sit down with people in P&G, HR, legal, tell them what I need to succeed at my peak. I need an interpreter, I need captioning, and also talk about the business case for it. For example, captioning not only benefits the deaf, but also hard of hearing individuals mm -hmm. and those who English, for whom English is their second language. So I think Susan is exactly right. A lot of the time we look at a disability and don't realize a lot of the different innovations or accommodations that not only make it easier for the person with a disability, but at the same time make life easier for others, it makes it better and even easier. I think just so, and that, right, and, and that's the, the magic nugget. Yeah, and then that, I think the film festival too, it, it, it has so many points for different people to um, to be impacted, so it could be the all the variety of accommodations and saying, oh, that could really work with us, or I see how that impacted me and helped me. But it also is the stories, just the understanding, because when you know somebody's story, you know them, and then suddenly it doesn't feel like an accommodation; it feels like an, a connection and a tool for connection. Well, you know that thing with that Scott that you were just talking about with closed captioning. As someone who is getting older, I'm 70, mm -hmm. um, I have hearing issues and my wife has hearing issues and closed captioning is very important to us. So it's, you know, disabilities of different types come at different times in your life. And I'm wondering if you think the Real Abilities Film Festival has impacted the openness of local businesses to, to try things, to experiment on a day-by-day -day basis. Suze? I mean, I, I really think, you know, we, LAD began after the 2015 festival to partner with the Chamber of Commerce who piloted a, an inclusion for people with disabilities small, in small business program. Um, there has been a lot of open discussion about hiring, but also how you support um, people being who they are in the workplace. And that has been the whole message of this festival. And so, yes, absolutely, uh, businesses are using this festival as a tool to send the message to their employees. Who you are is right by us. We want you to bring your true self and your true perspective to work every day. And that's the message of these films. And you walk away feeling more connected to your fellow man. Scott, do you plan on uh, attending the, some of the films? 
Oh, definitely. Yes, including the Def Jam. I'm really <laughs> looking forward to that one. That's why I wanted to use that. <laughs> so, first off, yeah. congratulations. Thank you. thank you for leading this. Scott, thank you for being here this morning and for the work you do and for the inclusive example that you provide for all of us uh, and, for, and that Procter & Gamble provides. Real Abilities will run from March the 9th through the 12th and centralized this year at the Duke Energy Convention Center. So you don't have to run around as in past years. You can get the entire schedule for the 40 films that will be screened as well as the Interfaith Breakfast, the opening lunch, special events for Brett veterans by going to Cincinnati, Cincy, uh, pardon me, going to go cincy.realabilities.org. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Next week I'll be joined by Dan Knowles, the head of Tri-State Veterans Community. Have a good week. <laughs>